Hello, nerds. Welcome to the History Nerds United podcast. I'm your head nerd, Brendan. Welcome to episode one of season two. Thank you so much for being here. What do you think of the new intro music? I think it's pretty cool, right? we got a lot of great stuff coming for you in season two. Just want to say that we are still technically a bi-weekly podcast, but we decided to go ahead and record so many. We're going to be weekly for a while, so keep watching every Wednesday. We'll let you know what's coming up. It's going to be a lot of fun. To start off, season two, The Ghosts That Haunt Me, Memories of a Homicide Detective by Steve Ryan. Steve was an amazing interview. Retired Toronto homicide detective. Now he's a reporter. A lot to talk about. He's very open about these cases and how they affect him, how they affect him to this day. Really amazing to talk to this guy. And I should warn everybody, he is going to be talking about some murder cases and things like that. It gets a bit graphic, right? If you're really squeamish, no problem. We'll see you next week with the next episode. But if you can get through it and listen to the violence a little bit, Steve has a lot of amazing things to say. This is a great episode, and I'm going to shut up so we can get to it. Steve Ryan, let's talk to him. And here we go. Author and retired homicide detective Steve Ryan talking about his book, The Ghosts That Haunt Me, Memories of a Homicide Detective. Steve, thanks so much for coming on. My pleasure. And listen, the, the real deal, you know, grow up in Canada and everything like that, I need to know what's it like growing up in Toronto, right? Ne- never been to Canada yet. Going to do it. What's it like up there? How many times do you say A in this interview? What's the over-under? <laughs> well, A comes quite often, quite natural, actually. So we, uh, back in the day when I was uh, growing up as a, just a young boy in the 70s, um, it was called Toronto the Good. Rarely did we have any homicides. And we had one homicide back in the late 70s, and I was just under 10 years old, that affected me and the city, for that matter, to the point where that was my goal was to be a, a homicide detective. And that's what I worked towards. And I know coming from a family of police officers, too, you know, my oldest brother, day one, he he always wanted to be a cop. That's what, he, you know, first grade, what do you want to be? You want to be a cop in that. And now you were just a bit more specific. You didn't say, I want to be a police officer. You said, I want to be a homicide detective. Always fascinated by homicide. And when I uh, got on the job, uh, I started at 18. We had what was called a cadet program back in the day. It was like an apprenticeship. So you wore a police uniform. You were, we rode the Harleys and we kept trafficking, basically. And then when I got and we had to go to Ontario Police College, where all the police officers in the province need to go once you're hired. And I was hired by Toronto, went to the police college for roughly four or five months for training, did some training back here. And then you go into one of the uh, police stations. And uh, my goal was to get into homicide as quickly as I could. And it took me about 15 years before I, I finally got there. Because yeah, a lot of people, I think, don't realize that you don't just show up and be like, I'd like to be a detective now, please. Like, you've got you to gotta walk the beat and kind of do the grunt work before they say, hey, maybe you can kind of solve crimes more than just walk around and try and stop them. Yeah, that's right. So our police officers on the beat are called constables. We got a lot of British tradition. And from there, you go to a sergeant and a sergeant and a detective are the equivalent rank. Clearly, a detective is plain clothes. And then your next rank is staff sergeant and detective sergeant. And that was my rank. So I went from uh, a detective at a, at a division, basically investigating break and enters, robberies, thefts, assaults. And then I went to a sex crimes unit and I dealt with the serial rapists for five years. And that was my uh, the stepping stone in the homicide. So you're checking a lot of boxes in the Law and Order TV show way, right? You got SVU, what I, what we call it down here because of the TV show, and then you know the full on Law and Order. First of all, I have to ask: Can you even watch those shows? Or are they so ridiculous that you're like, I got nothing to do with this? Great question. They are ridiculous. I've got nothing to do with them. Uh, number one. Number two. Because, especially in sex crimes and in homicide, you were surrounded by grief, twenty four hours a day, seven days a week. I stay as far away from that stuff as I possibly could and can. Now, one thing I will notice, your book hits this, and I know from watching Law & Order for years, the getting up in the middle of the night, that's something that kind of carries through, you know, most of the stories that you have in your book, right, is that homicides especially generally don't happen during the day. They're much more likely to happen sometime at night, and that's when you're getting called and things like that. It's got to be rough just just from a, before any of the horrors come into it. It's got to be rough just you're waking up in the middle of the night, and you know you're waking up for a bad reason. Something has gone wrong. That's a lot of wear and tear on you, isn't it? Oh, it certainly is. So how how it works up here is that we had six teams in a homicide squad, and I was the detective sergeant. I was in charge of the case. So if things went south with my head that got lopped off, and I worked with uh, detectives. And when you're on call, 
just like any other business, you're on call until a homicide comes in. And we had three call teams. So if you are between one and three, you structure your personal life around the fact that your phone or pager could go off at any moment. So what used to freak me out when I was on call was that I'd be out for dinner, having a round of golf, watching the, the hockey game. And I would feel that there's somebody out there with a black cloud right over their head and they just don't know it. And I'm going to meet them at some point in the next 24 hours, 48 hours, however long it took to, to, for homicide to occur. And that used to just not sit well with me. And I still think about that to this day. And especially from my time in the army, that sleep deprivation just, it keeps hitting you. And especially as you get older, you know, when you're in your twenties, early thirties or something, Hey, I only got a couple hours last night. I had a few too many tequilas. I'll be fine. Get up, go for a run or something like that. Especially as you're, you're getting up there in years, that's pulling you down. And just like you said, there's that dark cloud 24 seven. And then on top of that, physically, it's beating you up. Even if you're, you know, sitting around. Well, yeah, that's right. And you go around the clock. So we used to, I only see the old 48 hours, that TV show. Well, that's not a far stretch from first 48 hours. You are going constantly because you're gathering the evidence. Uh, If there's no suspect, you're trying to identify one. And if there is a suspect, for the most part, you are chasing them. And then you got to figure you're doing a death notification within that time. You're attending an autopsy within that time. You're getting a cause of death and you are updating the media. It's a constant 48 hours of just nonstop stuff. And it's a homicide. So you can't afford to make a mistake because somebody could be acquitted if you, as the officer in charge, basically screw up in your investigation or cut corners. And I forgot search warrants. Our search warrants up here sometimes require three, 400 pages of typing because our whole case has to be explained to a judge before a judge is going to give us authorization to go into any car, any house or any 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 structure for that matter. Do you get a lot of uh, detectives who wash out pretty quick? Like they think this is their dream job and they get there and they say, this is not for me. I can't keep it up. We've had detectives that would come into that office and do the first homicide and say, again, that's not for me. I'll go back to the division and investigate robberies, theft of bicycles, you know, uh, assaults, because it's high stakes and it is, uh, it's taxing on you psychologically. I mean, that book is the most honest that I have ever been with myself when it comes to the effects of that work on my, my personal life, my family's life, and everything about you know, how I exist today. And let's talk about it. What made you say, like, now's the time? Now's the time to write this book. Now's the time to put it on paper and put myself out there. What was the impetus for it? So I left the job after 30 years, and I started a new career reporting crime on television for a TV station, which is like a mini CNN here. It goes everywhere. And I had always been thinking about writing a book. And when I was away from the job, I really started to notice the effects of the job on me that I knew back in the day when I was working, but I chose to ignore them. And they got progressively worse and worse when I got away from police work, not to mention when I went back to report on a homicide scene, when they sent me back to our superior court to watch a homicide trial to report on it, I I couldn't take it anymore. So I thought, I need to put this down on paper, and that's why I wrote the book, just to be completely honest with myself and share my experiences with you know whoever was interested in listening to it or reading it. I mean, when I read it, right, you say the ghosts that haunt me. As I'm reading it, I'm like, oh, no, this is this is not a tagline for a book. Um, on my blog, I talk about it. Like, I have PTSD from my time in the military and everything like that. And I could see that the way you're writing it is you were struggling with some of this stuff, that you were really thinking about it and saying, like, this is in my head, and especially with things that, you know, quote, unquote, haunt you, they're always bouncing around. Is that true for you? true. I had a tough time enjoying anything. And in the book, I talk about feeling like I'm looking through a pane of glass at life. I had a tough time smiling because of what I've seen over the years, seeing moms drop to their knees when they do a death notification, seeing a child dismembered and stuffed in a suitcase. It didn't allow me to enjoy anything because it was no big deal. It was no big deal if you scratched up your sports car, not that I have one, but it was no big deal if you lost your, your Gucci shoes because that is stuff. The real stuff that happens is what I've seen. So I struggled with trying to find happiness in in anything. And it's a really rough time, but how did you decide on these six? Because I have to think that these six stick with you, but they're probably not all of them, are they? Oh, no. I did over 150 homicides, and I remember each and every one of them. But these were cases that people, not only in the city of Toronto, but in the country, could relate to because they were high-profile cases. So they were easy to talk about. Well, in a sense, they were more familiar to the people that was going to read them as opposed to other cases that I would have written about that would not have the same impact because a lot of people would say, well, I don't know about that case. But these six cases, the entire country knew about. 
And something about these six cases, it really gives you a look into the life of being, you know, a detective police officer. I, Holly Jones is the first one up, right? And we won't dig into every single one of them because everyone needs to read this book. But I remember Holly Jones, I'm reading it and I'm like, oh, no, 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 there isn't the eureka moment or this or that. Holly Jones was, you were in the sex crimes unit and it was just, hey, we're going to canvas. We're going to talk to people. And it's about hard work and not like some magical thing that all of a sudden somebody has an idea and you solve a case. You, you got to go out and you got to do the work. And it was just really good, solid police work that ended up solving that case for you. Yeah, that's right. It was one of those rare occasions when you've got a stranger on stranger abduction. Usually when a child is abducted, a 10-year-old child is abducted, it's usually familial. It's usually a family member of some sort that in a custody dispute will take this uh, little girl or a child. In this case, it was a pedophile who took her on her way back to her friend's house, and uh, he sexually assaulted her, he dismembered her, and he threw her in Lake Ontario, which is behind me, in different bags. So on different days, different parts of her remains would surface. So we had all of that evidence. Then we got DNA. We had DNA. She was obviously scratching at this guy, and she got DNA under her fingernail. So at least we had something to go on. When you look at the, the literal needle in a haystack, we had something on that needle that we just needed to identify. And just those high-level details are, are vicious. And the first aspect, right, is that this stuff is haunting you. But the second aspect, which I see that other people are picking up on, too, that I picked up on, you were making sure that you were respectful to the victims and their families telling this story. How do you make sure you do that, right? Besides writing it in a way that, you know, doesn't make them sound like objects, how do you make sure that the respect for the family and the victim comes out when you're writing? Thank you for saying that. And that actually means a lot to me because that was my goal, not only to speak about how I felt, but to give all of those victims a voice. They were people. And I wanted to speak about them in a way that didn't really concentrate on the salacious details, but spoke about their lives. And unfortunately, I got to know them in death and not in life. And what I learned in death about them from investigating and from talking to their families, they were just people like you and I. And yes, they were a headline. But they were more than just a headline. They were somebody's brother or sister. And that's what I tried to do in this book was to be respectful and make sure that people who are reading that knew that these were people and their families hurt and they still hurt to this day. Do you have to reach out to the victims' families to do this? Or is it just you got the case files and you know what to let out and what not to let out? Like, how do you how does that process even look? Yeah, it, another great question. I don't have to reach out to the families. Um, and all of what I wrote was basically from my memory. And if I needed to jog my memory, I would just research something uh, on the internet. But when it comes to my feelings, um, they were easy to recall. Because even my, my children, when my daughter's you know, grown now, she's a 26-year-old, she's a lawyer. Um, but she helped me write this. And she was able to recall moments where she could see how much this affected me, my mental health. And that, so that part of it was easy to write. And that was an important part of what I want to convey as well was, look, cops are just people as well. And it affects them. Like, I can't even describe to you how viewing or seeing what I've seen for all these years, how it's affected me, you know, mentally, physically, socially, 100% all the way around. Opening this door, right, and start talking about these things, I, I got to think that doing it with your daughter was just kind of an extra help, right? Because not only are you doing it, you're bringing somebody in the family into it so they can really see what's going on, you know, in the background of this stuff, right? Yeah, that's right. And surprisingly to me, she was able to recall a lot of situations when she was just a kid. So when you think kids don't absorb what's going on around them, this is my proof that they certainly do. Because she would say to me, yeah, dad, I remember, you know, outside of the pool, I remember you picking me up and, and, things you said or things you ignored, the way you looked. Um, I spent a lot of time by myself. I missed out on a lot of, um, I mean, I coached my son's baseball, his hockey team. But other than that, I missed out on a lot because I spent a lot of time alone just thinking about these cases, thinking about how I'm going to solve them, thinking about the autopsy that I, I saw of a 10-year-old or a girl that was stuffed in a suitcase. That stuff I just can't, I can't get rid of. And even to this day, I struggle with it. Like the lake behind me here, you commented on, oh, that's a beautiful view. I struggle with looking at that and saying, that's a beautiful view, because I think about the cases that I investigated and solved, and that's to me what was important. That lake behind me, although it is pretty, it's not important to me, and it still isn't. I work on every day trying to say to myself, that's a beautiful view, but it's a struggle. And I do want to put a, a very strong emphasis on something you just said. Kids are always listening and pulling it in. I know my seven-year-old 
If I'm thinking she's not listening, she's listening and it's going to come up later. And listen, they will dime you out in a second, too. That's something else I've learned real fast. Yeah, agree. Agree. She recalled things that uh, jogged my memory. She recalled just kind of weird things that she was able to notice and, and share with me. And then I went, oh, yes, you saw that. Oh, yes, you heard that. She would say, don't forget what she'd write, which which she'd proofread what I wrote. Don't forget this. And I'd say, how do you know that? Because I heard you talking on the phone. She was just a kid. But she heard me talking about a case on the phone, getting details, talking to a crown attorney, which is a DA in your country. Um, she just heard it. She and my son heard it. My son was busy chasing basketballs and hockey pucks and baseball to really care. But my daughter more, she absorbed it a lot more. And that's kind of going to open a new wound for you, right? Because now you're sitting there saying, was I not careful enough? Should I have been doing X, Y, Z? And now this is just coming up now, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's one thing I said to her was, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that as a kid, you had to hear all of that. So her and my son are so familiar with homicide. It, it's frightening to me. They are so familiar, even the landmarks throughout the city of Toronto. You can see behind me. Oh, I don't know if you can see behind me, but there is a, an island out there called Center Island. It's an amusement park. And I used to go there as a kid with my parents all the time. It was just a place that was free. It was away from the city, probably a 20-minute ferry ride. You could see the skyline of the city of Toronto. It's a beautiful spot. Holly Jones remains surfaced because when the tide took her out, by, by the grace of God, a, a, a divine uh, intervention, some of her body parts hit that island. So my task was to go over to that island, get view those body parts, and then interview the guy who, uh, who, who found them. So I haven't been back to that island since, and I have a tough time looking at it to this day because that's what I remember. And you've got to think, too, when you spend so much time in one city, it's for you, it's probably everywhere. 100 homicide cases, and that's just when you're homicide, right? There's everything else before that. Are you finding you're able to kind of break through the glass, like you mentioned before, like that you're starting to be able to see things and get that smile on your face and have it be genuine, or is it still a battle for you? It's still a battle, and uh, to your point, every place in the city is a landmark to me, and not only to me, to my to my kids. My son, I used, we used to live north of Toronto before we moved back. It was just a, too long of a drive for me. And we, he played baseball, and when we played ball teams in the city here, he would say to me, is that park near that triple homicide, Dad? Is that building near where you were at the movies that night and you got called out to do a homicide? So not only for me, but for my kids as well, the city has landmarks, and they're not good landmarks. And what still freaks me out to this day is I will go by a park or I'll go by a building where years ago it was carnage. Years ago there was blood, body parts, uh, dead people all over, and now there's people having a picnic in that same park, which is a good thing. But I have a different view of that exact same place. My memory of that is different than yours would have been throwing a baseball with your son. I would see that park and not even see the ball diamond. I would just see what I saw all those years ago. So there's a lot of parts of the city that uh, are bad for me um, to recall. For instance, where Holly Jones was killed, I literally get the shakes when I drive past uh, her house, which is on Bloor Street. It's a very long street here in the city that goes from my place into the city of Toronto. And I literally get the cold sweats and the shake. Every time I have to drive by there, I avoid it until there's traffic jams or I need to go on that route. But uh, it's a tough go for me going by past just her house. And is this the first one that really stung you? Because this is when you were in sex crimes unit and, you know, kind of one of your first cases, so to speak. Is that the first one where you started to feel that it started to hit you? Was there cases before that? Or was this the first one where you're like, hey, this is where stuff started to really stick on me? Homicide started to stick on me, but I spent five years in a sex crimes unit and talking to a victim of sexual assault and hearing them say, I wish he had killed me, strikes you almost as much as a homicide. With a homicide, you're dealing with the victim's families. With a sex crime, you're dealing with the victim themselves, who are living, thankfully. Um, they're both as powerful, but homicide is far more gruesome because with a sex crime, you're hearing about the details. With a homicide, you're actually viewing just how cruel we as humans can be to one another. And it just leaves you speechless at times. I had a real tough time with, uh, and I want to make sure I say her name right, Melanie Bittersing. That's right. Yeah. It was a tough chapter to get through. And I mean, you know, you write really succinctly and your, your book's great. Like I told you, I read it on one night. That one sticks with me because when you're talking about kids parents and all of that stuff you can't fathom it i mean i know i listen i was a true crime nut for a long time now i've gotten a little bit away from it because of for lack of a better term commercialization of it and completely forgetting the victims right 
Um, but I know when I when my daughter came along, all of a sudden, if I was watching, you know, ID investigation discovery, and there was a child murder or something, I'm like I'm skipping this episode. I can't do it anymore. That one too, it it got you some notoriety too. I'm just researching you. It seems like her name comes up when they talk about you a lot. Can you tell me just a little bit about that one and how that one came up? Yeah, that was a case that really affected the entire country. And there was some interest in that investigation in Europe and in the States as well. So she was a young girl who came from Jamaica. She came to live with her two brothers and her father and her stepmom and her mom in Jamaica. I've been over there twice on this investigation. Let her go or wanted her to go for a better life. The problem was, and I lobbied to have this changed, and it hasn't been changed yet. When she entered Canada, when she got off that airplane, nobody knew she was here. So she didn't go to school. She didn't go to the doctor. And she just suffered. It was the worst child abuse case. Well, I did the, the, the two of the most uh, severe child abuse cases ever in this country. And she was locked in the closet. She was made to sleep on a piece of cardboard, made to go to the bathroom on, on the balcony. Uh, all of her bro- bones were broken. For a 13-year-old girl, she weighed about 40 pounds. And when she died, they put her in a suitcase carried her out, took her north of the city, and set it on fire. And that was 1994. So we weren't able to identify who she was until 2012, I believe. And all these years, people were trying to identify who she was, but nobody knew she was here. And her mom back in Jamaica was told that she ran down to the States, or she went down to the States, rather, to go on a running scholarship, on a track scholarship. So her mom tried to track her down all these years later, but of course, she couldn't because uh, uh, she had died. And just quickly on that, her brother, the allegation was just before she died that he fell from the balcony because he was being abused as well. I don't believe that. I, um, I believe that he was about to get beaten. And I got this from a witness. And he tried to escape one balcony to the other, 22 stories up, and he fell. And he was only 14 at the time. So I had his body exhumed after Melanie's uh, uh, case w- was done because I wanted to see if there was any evidence. Well, clearly, you fall 22 stories. There's not. But here's how it affects you. The night before we exhumed his body, after work in a snowstorm, I went, and it was very, very cold. I remember this night like it was yesterday. And I went to the cemetery, and I actually talked to him. And I apologized for the fact that we were going to take his body out of the ground, and he'd have to go to an autopsy, and that I was disturbing him. And I basically said, sorry, kid. Like, I am sorry for disturbing you. It, it brings tears to my eyes. And think about it. This is important, because if somebody killed you, I want to know. And uh, at the autopsy, they clearly couldn't tell because he was just broken bones after falling that many stories. But thankfully, he and his sister were repatriated back in Jamaica uh, with their mom. And that will tell you just how much it affects a homicide detective when you're going to a cemetery in the middle of the dark, in the middle of the night, I should say, in a snowstorm to talk to somebody who's been dead for 10 years at that time. It's one of those stories that you're writing about facts, but I remember... Every page on that story, I'm like, that doesn't make any damn sense. S- stuff that I'm just sitting there going, what the hell? Like, common sense is completely gone from this story because there were so many people doing such, first of all, horrific things that you'd never right believe. And then other people who just don't seem to be thinking through consequences and stuff like that. But I mean, that's that's got to be one of those stories where it even tested your ability to understand like just evil and what happened because it's so horrific. You you want to come up with a different reason that something happened than what actually happened, right? Yeah, again, great. You're very astute. Great comment. And I gave up asking why could this happen a long time ago. And that was one of the reasons. And one of the things I'll never forget, she used to be put into a broom closet overnight. And there were scratches on the wall of the broom closet. And I often thought, you know, when you're a little, you, uh, you, if you're hurt, if you're hungry, if you're scared, you call out to your mom and your dad for protection. Who was she calling out for? Nobody. Her mom and her stepmom were, were just torturing her, and her nail marks were on the inside of the door. Who was she crying out to? Absolutely nobody. But she was trying to scratch through the wall to get out through the other side. But the moment she got off that plane, she was held prisoner in that apartment complex, and she never saw the light of day. And if I remember correctly, just to add more stuff that you can't believe into this, there were other kids who were treated fine in that family, right? So the stepmom had her own three children, and Melanie was responsible for them. And if the stepmom thought that uh, they were dirty, the stepmom thought that Melanie was responsible for them crying or that they weren't well-behaved, Melanie would pay the price for it. So Melanie and her brothers were meant to sleep on uh, cardboard boxes. Melanie had to sleep on the balcony. And Elaine, who was the stepmom, 
her three kids got to sleep in a bed. So there was two bedrooms for her three kids and for the couple. And then there was the uh, parkade floor for uh, Melanie and her two brothers. I'm guessing sleeping outside in Toronto is not always the most pleasant situation possible. Oh, it's cold. It's cold as heck. And uh, she had a bucket to go to the bathroom and she would shower in rainwater. Um, and that's all she had. She had absolutely nobody. And when you get to the part in the investigation when she died, there's a part of you that goes, thank God she did. Because the torture, the last time her older brother saw her, she was crawling out of the apartment because she had all broken bones. So the pathologist was able to say she didn't run from anywhere. Like her bro- bones were all broken. So she dragged herself out in the hall and her older brother was made to go find her. And he found her in the stairwell. And he said to her, we got nowhere else to go. Who are we going to call? Because when they got off the plane, their dad convinced them that the police were evil, that the police aren't your friend. So he said, we can't call the cops. What are we going to do? You got to come back into the apartment. And that was the last time he saw her. I believe she died that night. And then the family took her and discarded her. And they told him, oh, she ran away. And he said to us, there's no way she ran away. There's no way she ran away. And the pathologist confirmed that. It must be a daily battle to not want to beat the ever-living hell out of people on a day-to-day basis when you're working homicide. How do you not just do something bad to that guy once this all starts getting put together? I mean, it's it, you're human. you got to have these thoughts, right? Yeah, that's right. And when somebody says to me, do you believe in the devil? Do you believe in evil? I'll say 100% because I saw it and I've talked to them. So part of my job was an interviewer slash interrogator. And when you sit across the table from a man or a woman who you know are, is, are responsible for that vile act, you do want to reach out and just punch them out. You do want to choke them out. But I'm all that stands between them being acquitted or being convicted. And if I'm going to take a proper statement from you, our laws are very, very strict as to the voluntariness of a statement. So I got to make sure you're warm. I got to make sure you're fed. I got to make sure you're not tired. And I cannot humiliate you. So it's the toughest thing in the world to say, okay, sir, um, I'm going to talk to you about this. And are you warm? Do you need to go to the bathroom? Because the moment you say to me, I need to go to the bathroom. And if I said to you, well, just answer this question for me, then we get to the bathroom, that statement is gone. Because the argument would be, you need to go to the bathroom. And you just answered my question because you needed to go to the bathroom. So looking at those hands that are responsible for that type of murder or any murder for that matter, it's very difficult. You come out of an interview with them and you want to just change your suit. You need, actually, I, I went outside the police station after interviewing them. So I just felt I met the devil and I can't breathe. And I had to go outside and stand on a busy street just to get my composure because looking at them was very, very difficult for me. I want to compare and contrast TV again here, especially talking about interrogations. It's usually not some criminal mastermind in an interrogation, right? First of all, a lot of criminals are dumb. That's why a lot of them get caught. And also, it's not this gigantic mind game. A lot of times when you see real interrogations, either the person breaks right away or the detective will know right away that they're lying. It's just a matter of asking the questions that gets you there. That's more reality, right? Yeah, for sure. Sometimes um, you can be in an interview room, as long as you're comfortable, you being the accused person, you could be in an interview room with me uh, for four hours, five hours at a time. The court said that's okay as long as you're not tired or I'm not abusing you. And all of our interviews are videotaped. It's not on video. It didn't happen. And you've got interview techniques that I could use, statement analysis. It's not evidence, but I can tell by your statement which way to take my interview just based on some of the words, some of the tenses of phrases you are, you are using. But as you said, most of these criminals are not rocket scientists. If they were, I've never caught them. You know, it's not tricks, but we can use tricks as long as they're above board. And you use the old, oh, I understand. Meanwhile, you're dying a thousand deaths inside. I understand what you did. And you give them an out to to give uh, something. Some of them bite and some of them are are just really too dumb to say anything. And they just keep their keep their mouths shut. It always seems like the lie will come out if you just keep asking the question sooner or later, you go back and say, wait a second. No, 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 no. You said you were on Third Street, not Fourth Street. And then it just starts to unravel from there. Is it usually something that simple that kind of makes them break down or is it, you know, much more of a process normally? It's a process. It's like if you saw a movie, I would say to you, tell me about the middle of the movie. Tell me about the beginning of the movie. Now let's go back to the middle. Now the end. What happened before the end? So if you're lying, you didn't see that movie and you just saw the trailer, you can't tell me about the rest of that. So I can pick up on that stage as to whether you're lying to me or not. Oftentimes, too, silence is golden. You know, when you're in a car with somebody and nobody's talking, it's very awkward and uncomfortable. And 
ultimately somebody says something really stupid. Like, hey, the clouds are very fluffy today. It's ridiculous, but they are uncomfortable with the silence. So oftentimes, juries have seen my interviews where there's an hour that goes by and you and I are just staring at each other. And as an investigator, I want to break the silence. But you're hoping that that human nature in a person comes out where they say something stupid. And that, that often happens. Another thing they do is say, my lawyer told me not to talk. And you shut them up and say, you don't need to talk. I'm going to talk. And then you just talk, 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 talk. And eventually, most of them crack and will say something. And I will confirm that I became a podcaster because I'm very uncomfortable with silence. This is a way to just kind of force that conversation to make sure it happens at all times. Absolutely. So speaking of conversations, some police officers might say that you went to the dark side. You are a reporter now. You are with the media. How did that transition happen? Well, because I, I did many of our whole high profile cases in the city, I got to know all the major media outlets in the city. And one of my last cases was another case where a doctor was stuffed in a suitcase. And at CP24, which is my uh, employer now, uh, they had a, a retired traffic cop, the, the OPP. It's like the state troopers, and they do all the highways. And he'd been retired for years. And he said to me, he was reporting on my case. And he said to me, uh, how are you doing? And I said, Cam, I'm done. I'm just done with this. So he picked up the phone, called his boss, who now is my boss, and it was that simple. Now, the cops appreciate what I do here because I'm able to analyze and tell people, because not many people know the truth about what the police do. And I can say, no, this is not happening. It's this that's happening. Or I can interpret a crime scene because you can only kill somebody so many ways. The only thing that changes is the location, the face, and the name. Everything else is the same. Explain where the shell casings are. Explain blood spatter. Explain all of that stuff. I've seen it a million times. So that's appreciated here in the city. And to give you an idea, I'm stopped without a word of a lie 100 times a day for pictures photos for selfies, for people to stop and say, I appreciate the work you do because you give us insight into what's going on. So that's how it worked. That's how it turned out. Have you gotten any flack for going to the media? I know there's a lot of, you know, police officers who will understand like, hey, that's the next stop. They're doing good things. But I know that some just by I want nothing to do with it and everything like that. Have you gotten any blowback from that at all? No, not one bit. And that's because I give insight as to what's happened. And let's say there's a report, media's reporting that an officer, and look, if, if excessive use of force was used, I'll call it. But for the most part up here, there's not a lot of that goes on. So they'll, somebody will say, well, he, this person was hit or they were struck with this when they're trying to make an arrest. And you ever have a case, you ever try to pick up your kid when they're little and they tighten themselves up and they lie on the floor and you can't move them? Mm -hmm. Well, that looks bad on TV. When you got three cops trying to pick somebody up, it looks bad when their arms are together and you, you can't pry them apart. So that's the sort of things I explain. So the police can't say that to the media. I can say that. And I, it's basically my opinion, but I'm usually right. Just And that doesn't, I don't want to come off as cocky. It's just because I've seen it. So I can explain all those different procedures and what something might look like and what the reality of it is. And now, of course, in the United States the past couple of years, there's been just you know a lot on the police and all of these things that have happened. Has any of that kind of gone across the border? Was Canada dealing with anything like that? Or is it just kind of like, oh, the United States is going through one of their things again, and everything's hunky-dory up here? We pay attention to the states mo probably more than we should. So cases, those high-profile cases in your country, we actually take training lessons from them. Like we can, I say we, the, the cops now can watch something and go, boy, that was wrong. We should, you know, do X, Y, or Z. George Floyd, that was one of those situations. When you get somebody on the ground, your first responsibility is to get them off the ground and get them off their chest. Their care and their health is in your hands. And we are taught, or I was taught, never to put pressure on a person's back. If you've got them on the ground, you, you, it's positional asphyxia. You will die. So if I, I got you on the ground, the minute you're handcuffed and in, under control, got to get you up, man. Got to get you up. And if you set them hungry again, we got to get you something to eat or something to drink. Not not kneel on a person's back for, for minutes or however long that, that cop was on his back for, because, I mean, that's insane. So we, as the police, when I was on the job at the time, looked at that, and there was training lessons. I, excuse me, I wasn't on the job, but something that I covered at the time. But the Toronto police and all, all the police, police officers in the greater Toronto area, um, they learned from that, and they took lessons from that. And uh, the school shooting in Colorado, back in, back in the day when I was on the job, um, Columbine, we changed our policies because of that. So the policies up here now are, if you're first on scene, sucks to be you, but you've got to get in that building. You've got to get into that school and engage that person 
in a gunfight. You cannot wait for backup if you've got an active shooter. It used to be you'd surround a place, wait for your backup, and then you'd go in with this plan with the SWAT team. Not anymore. If you're the first on scene, you got to get in there knowing that your backup is coming. And that's where cops are so brave is when they encounter those situations where you know somebody's in there with a, an assault rifle shooting it up. You've got to go. Otherwise, you're in trouble yourself. And rightfully so. You had that situation in Texas where I believe those police officers waited outside the school. That's something that wouldn't happen up here. And for, as far as I know, it wouldn't happen for the most part in the States as well. I don't know what the explanation for it was, but it was unacceptable when it comes to police work. And if it was up here, you've got to go in. If you're the only one, you've got to go and engage. Because if you're engaging that person in a gunfight, they're not shooting kids. They're shooting at you, and you've got a gun to shoot back. So that's the sort of things we learn with regards to training. And not to jump on any specific case, but I know coming from a family of police officers, nobody's more pissed off when a cop does something stupid than other cops. Because it's like, you've just made my life that much harder because you didn't do your job right. And you make us all look bad, and now all of a sudden we all have to look over our shoulders because you decided to not do your job. We had uh, three police officers killed here in the last three weeks. One was in uniform, was in a Tim Hortons getting a coffee, of all places, and a guy walked up and shot him in the back of the head just, just because he wanted to take his gun, and he went off and committed a couple of other murders. We had two cops killed. It's about an hour north of the city. I was up covering that as well. They went to a, uh, a domestic call, and as they were talking to this older couple, their grandson, who they were there to talk about because there was a, some sort of dispute going on, he came up the stairs with a semi-automatic and killed them both. So you talk about the thin blue line. The thin blue line is standing out in a 20 below zero snowstorm in your very thin dress uniform. You know what that's all about, being in the military, and standing at attention for hours, listening to the eulogies, and crying and being heartbroken. That's the thin blue line. To get to your point, the thin blue line is not covering up a crime when another cop does it, because you're absolutely right. When things happen that are inappropriate, it makes the job tougher for everybody because you do a good thing, not all cops are good. One cop does a bad thing, and now all of a sudden, you're all bad people. And that's not the reality in, in police work. So I do want to say, Steve, it's a great book. It's fantastic. Normally, what I ask authors as the last question is, you know, people are like nonfiction. I don't like, not, I don't like history and stuff like that. True crime's big business nowadays, right? So I'm not going to ask that question. I'm going to change it up a little bit. Why your book? Somebody's into true crime. Why should they read your book? Why should it be number one on their list? A few reasons. Number one, it's a first-hand perspective. It's not salacious. It's respectful to everybody that was involved. And um, they are real cases. And it shows the effects of, of being a police officer in, in such a job. And I think it humanizes cops. It, it, when we, I, they are not superheroes with capes on them. They're just, I know it's very cliche, but they're just people. They're just people, and I give an honest view as to what I saw and certainly how it affected me personally. So that's the reason why. Steve, it's a great book. I hope you got at least a little bit of healing writing this thing out. But thank you so much for coming on here and talking about it. Yeah, my pleasure. And that is it for this episode. Steve, thank you so much for coming on and sharing all of that stuff. The Ghosts That Haunt Me. Everyone go out and get it if you haven't already. It's a great book. If you like true crime at all, this is right up your alley. It is different and it is great. In the meantime, hit us up on social media, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. I'm on Goodreads if you want to find us there. Please listen to all the previous episodes of the podcast. Leave us reviews. It helps us a lot if you leave us reviews, everybody. Five stars, preferably. Come on. I, I think five stars is fine. You can do it. Until next time, nerds, which is next week, stay cool.